Good evening, everyone. My name is Dania, and I'm a lawyer at ICJP. I would like to thank all of you for joining us tonight at our panel, The War on Gaza, What's Next for Palestine, which is hosted by the International Center of Justice for Palestinians. The event was initially planned uh, uh, to uh, commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Oslo Accords, at, uh, which were signed in 1993, uh, but it has been updated to reflect the recent Israeli escalation uh, on Gaza, taking stock of the failures of the peace process, which is now more important than ever. During these rough times, it is important to acknowledge our shared responsibility to uphold accountability and bringing an end to the war crimes unfolding in Gaza and Palestine more broadly. What we have seen over the past three weeks is utterly harrowing. Israel has indiscriminately and heavily bombarded civilians and civilian infrastructure, used white phosphorus, which may amount to a war crime, displaced 1.4 million Palestinians with nowhere safe to go in Gaza, all while imposing a system of collective punishment on the two million civilian Palestinians who live in Gaza. We have also heard from UK government officials and politicians expressing their absolute support for Israel and its unconditional right for self-defense, all while failing to acknowledge the legal obligations that Israel has under international law. Tonight, we will, start the the, we will start this event with a keynote speech from Professor Avi Shleim, a Marathis professor of international law at the University of Oxford, which will then be followed by a panel discussion. The panel features Daniel Levy, who was directly involved in the negotiations in the Israeli negotiations team for the Oslo Accords. We will also be hearing from Waddah Khanfar, who is the president of Al Shark Forum, he was also former Director General of Al Jazeera, and Yasmin Ahmad, UK Director of Human Rights Watch. With a blend of experience from the media, politics, academia, and the third sector, we hope that this panel will provide a unique insight into the war on Gaza from a range of perspectives and will shed light on how the peace process stalled and failed and fell apart. The panel will be chaired by journalist Mohammed Hassan, who is an award-winning journalist and poet from Cairo and Auckland. His podcast series on Islamophobia, Public Enemy, was awarded the, golden tr the gold trophy at the 2017 New York um, Radio Awards. His collection of poetry, National Anthem, was published in 2020. He also runs a podcast at Middle East Eye called The Big Picture. After the panel is concluded, we will open up for Q&A. To set some rules, I understand that the events happening on the ground might stir some sensitivities for different people. These are tough times for everyone. However, I ask all of you to remain respectful in your questions and in, for the answers provided. I also ask of you to keep your questions short and straight to the point. I would also like to note that two of our speakers that were supposed to be on this panel could not attend as they were unable to leave Israel-Palestine. When Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005, it turned the enclave into an open-air prison. For the last three weeks, with the incessant bombardment of Gaza by land, sea, and air, Israel is turning Gaza into an open graveyard, a desolate wasteland. Last week, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, addressed the Security Council, and he said the Hamas attack on Israel on the 7th of October did not happen in a vacuum. It happened in the context of 56 years 
of suffocating Israeli occupation. The Israeli permanent representative to the United Nations, Mr. Erdan, responded with a vicious personal attack on the Secretary General, saying that the Secretary General accused Israel of blood libel, which he never did, calling for his resignation and topping it up with a call on members of the United Nations to stop funding the organization. Um, Israeli antagonism to the UN and obstruction of its work is nothing new. But the contrast between the decency and humanity of the Secretary General and the rudeness and crudeness of the Israeli representative was very striking. As the Secretary General said, the Israel-Hamas conflict did not begin on the 7th of October. In June 1967, Israel um, occupied not just Gaza, but the West Bank and Jerusalem. This is the most protracted and brutal military occupation of modern times. In 2005, Israel withdrew unilaterally. Israel withdrew its soldiers and settlers from the Gaza Strip. Israeli spokesperson said that by withdrawing, they gave the Gazans an opportunity to turn Gaza into the Singapore of the Middle East. I've never heard anything more preposterous in my life. Between 1967 and 2005, Gaza was a classic colonial situation. A few thousand Israeli settlers controlled 25% of the territory, 40% of the arable land, and the lion's share of the desperately short, desperately scarce water resources. Gaza is not backward, poor, impoverished, because the Gazans are lazy. Gaza is poor because of the Israeli strategy of de-development. Sarah Roy, a Jewish um, scholar at Harvard, the daughter of Holocaust survivors, is the leading expert on the Gaza Strip. She's written four books. Her first book was called The Gaza Strip, The Political Economy of De-Development. And there she shows in detail how Israel deliberately prevented Gaza from developing and exploited Gaza as a source of cheap labor and um, a market for its goods. There were two reasons for the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. One is that the price of occupation became too high. Hamas was conducting um, operations against the Israeli settlers and the Israeli army, and the price of occupation was simply too great to sustain. That was one reason for withdrawing. The second reason was demography. Um, Palestinians have a higher birth rate than Israelis, and the Israelis talk about the demographic bomb, that the increase in number of uh, Palestinians for me, this is not a bomb and not a threat that Palestinians have children on their own land. But for Israelis, it's a threat. And by withdrawing from Gaza, Israel uh, took out 1.4 million Palestinians from the demographic um, equation. Ariel Sharon claimed that by withdrawing from Gaza, he was making a contribution to peace. Um, but this was a unilateral Israeli move undertaken in what was considered to be Israeli national interests. And the official name was the uh, unilateral disengagement from Gaza. The aim 
uh, was not to, uh, the withdrawal from Gaza was not a prelude to further withdrawals from the West Bank. On the contrary, in the year after withdrawing 8,000 settlers from Gaza, Israel introduced 12,000 new settlers into the West Bank. Today, there are around 700,000 settlers on the West Bank and in Jerusalem. The aim of the Sharon government was to redraw unilaterally, not by negotiations, to redraw unilaterally the borders of greater Israel. The first step was the withdrawal from Gaza. The second step uh, was the so-called security barrier on the West Bank. The security barrier was thought, said to be a temporary security measure, but it wasn't. The security barrier is more about land grabbing than it is about security. Uh, and the barrier is intended to mark the final borders of greater Israel. So the move was anchored in a fundamental rejection of Palestinian national rights. It was anchored in a determination to prevent the Palestinians from ever achieving independence on their own land. Moreover, by withdrawing from Gaza, Israel enabled the Israeli Air Force to bomb Gaza at will as they have been doing non-stop for the last three weeks, something they couldn't do when there were Israeli settlers in Gaza. In January 2006, Hamas won a fair and free election in all Palestine elections not just in Gaza, but in the West Bank as well, and proceeded to form um, a government. Israel refused to recognize this government and resorted to economic warfare to undermine it. And the United States and U European Union, to their eternal shame, followed Israel in refusing to recognize the democratically elected government and also resorted and joined Israel in economic warfare to undermine that government. This is just one example, one example out of many of Western hypocrisy in this conflict. The Western leaders say that they believe in democracy. They invaded Iraq, my homeland, in the name of democracy and completely destroyed it. And here, there was a remarkable example of democracy in action. The Palestinians, under incredibly difficult uh, conditions of military occupation, had a really good example of democracy in action. The people spoke, but the Western governments um, refused to recognize the result of the election because the people had voted for the wrong party. Worse was to come. And we know this, that there was a plot to topple Hamas. We know this from the Palestine papers, a cache of 1,600 official documents that were leaked to Al Jazeera, which showed that a secret committee was formed called the Gaza Committee. And there were four members of that committee, Fatah, Israel, an American general, and Egyptian intelligence. And the aim of this committee was to isolate and weaken Hamas, possibly even to instigate a civil war with the aim uh, and, and uh, to encourage Fatah to stage a coup and to recapture power. 
the aim of the plot was to, to drive um, uh, Hamas from power. Hamas responded by preempting the Fatah coup and seizing power violently in Gaza. This was um, I forgot to say that in June 2007, Hamas and Fatah formed a national unity government. It was a very moderate government. It consisted mainly of technocrats rather than politicians, and it called for negotiating with Israel a long-term ceasefire. And long-term was defined as 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, maybe 50 years, long-term ceasefire. Israel refused to negotiate. Uh, and then Hamas was forced to uh, preempt the Fatah coup and it seized power in Gaza. And since then, the two branches of the Palestinian family have been divided and kept by Israel strictly apart with Hamas ruling over Gaza and the Palestinian Authority ruling over the West Bank from Ramallah. Israel's next move was to impose a blockade on Gaza. A blockade that people forget has been in force for the last 16 years. For the last 16 years, there's been an Israeli blockade of Gaza, which involved incredible hardship for the inhabitants and is illegal. Um, a blockade is a form of collective punishment which is prescribed by international law. Having been denied the fruit of its electoral victory, Hamas resorted to the weapon of the week, to terrorism, and this took the form of rocket attacks from Gaza to southern Israel. Then there was a tit for tat and an escalation of hostilities. In June 2008, Egypt brokered a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. The ceasefire worked really well. In the six months before June, uh, the average number of rockets that hit Israel was 179. In the following months, the average monthly was three rockets. And by launching on the 4th of November 2008, a raid into Gaza which killed six Hamas lawyers, Israel violated the ceasefire and hostilities resumed. Hamas has an impeccable record of observing ceasefires. Every ceasefire brokered by Egypt, every single one has been violated by Israel when it no, no longer suited it. The first Israeli onslaught on Gaza in 2009 was called Operation Cast Lead. infrastructure. The United Nations Human Rights Council appointed a commission of inquiry headed by uh, the South African um, judge Richard Goldstone who happened to be both Jewish 
and a Zionist. The uh, Goldstein Report was issued. It is a remarkable document. It's 575 pages. It uh, details 33 episodes and war crimes. The report says both sides were guilty of war crimes, but they reserved the severest criticisms for Israel because of the scale of its war crimes. I'll give you just one example. Goldstone and his colleagues found seven incidents in which Israeli soldiers shot civilians leaving their homes on orders from the IDF holding a white flag. Can you see echoes of today? Um, the conclusion of the report was that the attacks were directed, at least in part, at the people of Gaza as a whole. It was, quote, a deliberately disproportionate attack designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize a civilian population, unquote. I'll repeat this in case you didn't hear it. It was a deliberately disproportionate attack designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize a civilian population, unquote. There have been many more Israeli onslaughts on Gaza. In 2014, sorry, 2012, 2014, 2021, 2022, and um, 2023. So by my count, this is the sixth serious Israeli onslaught on Gaza. I'm not going to go into any of the subsequent attacks. But I want to say this about the pattern of Israeli behavior. Um, Israeli generals has a have a phrase, mowing the lawn, which means cutting the grass. It's a chilling metaphor. What it means is that they have no solution to the problem, but every few years the IDF moves in with a lot of weaponry, the most advanced uh, weaponry, they smash up the place, they degrade the military capabilities of Hamas, they inflict severe infrastructure, severe damage on the civilian infrastructure, and they, then they go home and leave the problem completely unresolved. And it's a chilling metaphor because it's a mechanical action that you do periodically every few years um, and with no end. So there is no end to the bloodshed, and the next war is always round the corner. And it is, it's not a policy for dealing with Gaza, it's a non-policy, or rather, it's a military response to the problem. And there is an Israeli saying that if work, if force doesn't work, you use more force. But this is an asinine idea. If force doesn't work, it's because it's not an appropriate method for dealing with a political problem. And Israel's excessive, disproportionate, excessive use of military for brute military force ended up by uh, encouraging the rise of um, Hezbollah in Lebanon of, and of Hamas in the Gaza Strip. The g current government formed by Netanyahu at the end of last year is the most radical, the most extreme, and the most incompetent government in Israel's history. This, the policy guidelines of this government say, quote, the people, the Jewish people, have an exclusive and inalienable 
right to all parts of the land of Israel. In other words, only Jews have a right to the whole land of Israel. Palestinians have no rights. And it's this, this extreme position which makes bloodshed inevitable because there is no peaceful uh, way to assert Palestinian rights. Uh, in the current situation, Israel has a new war aim, which is to eliminate Hamas as a political and military force. This is new. And it's rather surprising that the aim now is to dismantle Hamas, because here is what Netanyahu said to his Likud colleagues in March 2019, and I quote, anyone who wants to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state has to support bolstering Hamas and transferring money to Hamas, that is part of our strategy, to isolate the Palestinians in Gaza from the Palestinians in the West Bank. On the 7th of October, Netanyahu, this cynical policy of Netanyahu collapsed spectacularly. His policy was to keep the Palestinian Authority weak, to allow Israel a free hand to do whatever it liked on the West Bank and to use the Palestinian Authority as a subcontractor for Israeli security and then to keep the Palestinians in Gaza cooped up in the open air prison and to contain them there. Well, the inmates of the prison broke out on the 7th of October and the whole uh, policy collapsed uh, overnight. Netanyahu had also been saying, the Palestinians are finished, they are defeated, they are irrelevant, we can do whatever we want, and we can have peace with the Arab world without any, making any concessions to the Palestinians. And I'm sorry to say that the Abraham Accords uh, vindicated Netanyahu. The Abraham Accords with Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, Morocco, and Sudan gave Netanyahu what he wanted, peace for peace, without, making, without any price being paid uh, by Israel, without any um, concessions on the Palestinian issue. Now uh, his policy is in tatters and he will pay the political price because before the 7th of October there was massive protest to his um, judicial reform or judicial overhaul uh, but that protest and opposition ceased on the 7th of October and now all Israelis are focused on the situation in Gaza, but when the war ends, and it may take a long time, the anger would be redirected at Netanyahu, and one commentator said that Netanyahu is a dead man walking. I hope so, but it's too soon to write him off. One thing is clear, he's a thoroughly unscrupulous leader, mendacious and unscrupulous. On the 2nd of June, 1948, Sir John Troutbeck, a senior official in the Foreign Office, wrote a memo to Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin. And in it he complained that the Americans by helping the creation of the State of Israel, that the Americans helped to create, quote, a gangster state with a thoroughly unscrupulous set of leaders. Um, I wouldn't 
I don't know, I wouldn't call Israel a gangster state, but I would certainly call uh, Netanyahu thoroughly unscrupulous. Uh, and uniquely, well, extraordinarily selfish because he, face, he faces, he's on trial for three very serious corruption charges, and he knows that if he goes to trial, he will be convicted and he will end up in jail. So everything he's doing revolves around political survival and staying out of jail, whatever the damage to Israelis and to, to his country. One disturbing aspect of the Israeli handling, the Israeli response to the attack of the 7th of October is the dehumanizing of the Palestinian people. Um, this is nothing new. Uh, on one occasion, Netanyahu famously suggested that it was Haj Amin al Husseini, the leader of the Palestinian National Movement, who suggested to Hitler that instead of uh, expelling the Jews from Germany, he should exterminate them. Today, many Israeli ministers are talking about Palestinians as Nazis. Um, Yoav Gallant, the defense minister, spoke of the Palestinians. He said, we are fighting human animals. And he used this view of the Palestinians to justify the siege that he imposed, the cutting off of uh, water, food, fuel, and medical supplies to 2.3 million people. Dehumanizing a whole people can lead to genocide. Hans Kohn, spelled C-O-H-N, wrote a famous book long ago called Warrant for Genocide. And in that book, he detailed the causal link between the, the Nazi dehumanizing of the Jews uh, and the Holocaust, the extermination of the Jews. The Western response to um, the crisis is the usual hypocrisy and ruthless double standards, but this time it's been taken to a new level. The, West, the Western love of Israel has always been accompanied, it always, has always depended on the erasing of Palestinian history and humanity. Deep concern for Israel's security is reiterated all the time by all Western leaders, but no thought is given to Palestinian security. Evidently, the Palestinians are the child our children of a lesser God. There's been a pilgrimage of Western leaders to Jerusalem to demonstrate that they are standing by Israel. Uh, Palestinian resistance has been decontextualized and dehistoricized. The Palestinians are engaged in an anti colonial struggle, possibly the last anti colonial struggle in today's world. But the struggle is attributed to religious fanaticism and irrational hatred of Jews rather than to the normal, universal desire of all people to live in freedom and dignity on its land. There is an echo here of the habitual colonial tendency to treat struggles for national liberation as proof of the savagery, barbarism, and terrorism of the indigenous population. This is how the civilized world, in inverted commas, responded to the liberation struggles of South, South Africans, Algerians, Kenyans, and Vietnamese. And this is how the, view, uh, this is how the West views the Palestinian struggle and Palestinian resistance uh, today. The United States and the United Kingdom are giving Israel not only moral, but material and military support. 
Uh, Biden, Joe Biden, has said that the attack of the 7th of October is the worst attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust. This is to trivialize the Holocaust. America has sent two aircraft carriers to the Eastern Mediterranean, ostensibly to deter Hezbollah and Iran. But what it is actually doing is shielding Israel, allowing Israel to carry on with the mass slaughter in Gaza. So what America is doing and Britain is doing is to give Israel warrant for genocide. In the last address to the nation, Netanyahu said that this is Israel, the Israelis are fighting the second war of independence. This is completely preposterous. It doesn't make any sense, but it is very worrying because in 1948, which was, uh, which was called Israel's War of Independence, 1948 was accompanied by the Nakba, by the catastrophe. And I fear that um, um, this so-called Second War of Independence will be accompanied by a second Nakba. Uh, my time is up, but if I may, I would like to conclude by quoting something that William Gladstone said in the House of Commons in 1876. He was the leader of the opposition. The prime minister was Benjamin Disraeli. And this is not an exact quote. It's what I remember from when I was an 18-year-old schoolboy in London doing A-level his British history. Gladstone said, uh, the context was um, soldiers of the Ottoman Empire committed atrocities in Bulgaria. And Gladstone said, and now I hope the Turks will carry off the abuses by carrying off themselves. The Zeftis and the Moody's, the Bimbashis and the Yuzbashis shall all, I hope, clear one and all from the province, province that they have desolated and profaned. Uh, th this is how I feel about Israel and Gaza today. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Abbey. That was very valuable and definitely a lot of points to unfold here. Now I would like to welcome our distinguished panel uh, Wadah Khanfar, Daniel Levy, Yasmin Ahmad, joined by Professor Avish Lame and chaired by Muhammad Hassan. Welcome. My name is Muhammad Hassan and it is my distinct pleasure to be chairing this panel of distinguished guests tonight. Thank you for Professor Avish Lame for uh, that incredible contextualization of everything that has led up to the moment that we are facing today and the conversation that we are about to have about where we go from here. Thank you also to the ICJP for hosting us and thank you to our guests for being here today. I'm going to uh, reintroduce them very quickly. So to my right is Wada Khanfar, who is the former Director General of Al Jazeera Media Network. In 2011, he was named by foreign policy among the top 100 global thinkers a year after that, he established Al Shark Forum, a nonprofit organization aimed at promoting democracy, pluralism, and justice throughout the Middle East and beyond. Next to him is, of course, sorry, I thought, <laughs> I thought Daniel Levy was sitting next to him. <laughs> next to him is, uh, of course, Professor Avi, Professor Avi Shlaim, who is a British Israeli historian, emeritus fellow at Oxford University, and former professor of international relations. If you haven't read his memoir, Three Worlds, Memoirs of an Arab Jew, I highly, highly suggest that you read it. It is an exceptional piece of work. Next to him is Yasmin Ahmed, who is the UK director of Human Rights Watch and the former executive director of Rights and Security International. She has worked as a public international lawyer for two decades with the UK and Australian governments and the United Nations at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, 
and the Serious Crimes Unit in Timor-Leste. Finally, Daniel Levy. Daniel Levy is a former negotiator for the Israeli government and played a key role in the Oslo Accords. He was also a senior advisor to Ehud Barak during his term as prime minister. He is now the president of the US Middle East Project and the former head of the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you all for being Sorry, here. Sorry, I have to, I, I was not a, I try and correct people. I was not a senior advisor to Ehud Barak. I was a advi senior advisor in the office of the prime minister under Ehud Barak, and there's a difference between the two, and I just want to, <laughs> no, because I just, I just want to get it right. Yes, absolutely, thank, thank you for you. correcting me. Yeah. Uh, and Sorry. please accept my apologies. Thank you for being here today. Please, can we give them a round of applause? Now, if you are like me, and I uh, believe that you are, you have spent the last three weeks in a state of paralysis. Mm -hmm. We have all consumed an enormous amount of footage and news that is hard to articulate and hard to process, and it is difficult to understand what to do with all of these emotions, all of this grief and anger, and what to do next. We are all attempting to find a way to grieve collectively, to grieve all lives collectively, to feel a sense of anger and to turn that anger into a sense of progress collectively. We have with us here four incredible minds, all of whom have documented the impacts of occupation and colonialism over 75 years, all of whom have great insights to share with us and we are about to have a conversation about what is happening today and hopefully what happens from here on towards a more constructive future. Well, Dahif, I can begin by asking you, as uh, uh, the sole Palestinian representative here on this panel, what it is like to witness what is happening and to try and articulate it within a greater context of a lived experience. Thank you very much. You know, in fact, what we see at this moment in time is an intense moment that the Palestinians have been going through uh, um, on various degrees for the last 75 years. So we are not uh, at all uh, going through something that we have never seen before, although the magnitude, the brutality, the genocidal uh, uh, attitude that the Israelis are now practicing in Gaza has not been actually witnessed. Uh, so the scale, the intensity is huge, but if you look at what has been happening, we have been going through continuous Nakba, basically from the moment of 1948 until now, the Palestinians are going through continuous Nakba and under a threat of resuming uh, atrocities against them uh, always, uh, continuously. We're supposed to be sitting today celebrating the 25th anniversary of establishing the state of Palestine based on Oslo Accords. You remember that? 1993, I mean, we're supposed to have a Palestinian state in five years after the conclusion of the accord. But where are we today? And now, yes, I agree that most of the time the Palestinian issue uh, is devoid, in, in unfortunately, in, in, the, in, the, in the minds of decision makers in the West, uh, in particular in the, the Americans and the British, unfortunately. Uh, from the context, so as if the world was living, we are living in peace and tranquility, and suddenly the crazy Palestinians on the 7th of October decided to shatter that peace because of something wrong in their psychology, because they are psychopaths. They would love to see this magnificent uh, paradise being destroyed. So, unfortunately, when you watch media and listen to diplomats and, and, and politicians in the West, this is the impression that ordinary people could, could get. But we have been going through this. You know, uh, Netanyahu, in his tweet, 
on the 28th of December 2022, when he spoke about the formation of the government, he mentioned explicitly that his role is to strengthen the control over the entire land of Israel. And the land of Israel, he said, it includes uh, Judea and Samira, West Bank, Golan, and includes, of course, the rest of, of Israel. And basically, he declared that there's nothing called Palestine or Palestinian land. And then the second was to uh, emphasize uh, on the Jewish status of Jerusalem, again. And the third, believe it or not, to create peace with neighbors. But not Palestinians. Palestinians are not neighbors because they do not exist. This is land without people. You, you should remember that. So it means we have peace with neighbors, which means we have to negotiate normalization with uh, Arab countries around us who have not been part of the, pro actually, the conflict. I mean, as uh, we did not see the armies engaged in a fight and suddenly we're going to have peace because basically we know that, uh, that the, 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 uh, most of the Arab countries have had a relationship for a long time, actually, with the Israelis, maybe not officially, but we know that they have been dealing with the Israelis. So the issue is that attitude, this kind of, of feeling of, of uh, supernatural right, the divine right to, to be exceptional and to have the impunity has been in a way or another, there for a long time, under the sight of the world. And we have not seen much from the Western-centric world order about this issue. And now, of course, because of the massive brutality and the very explicit uh, uh, announcement of, of, of dehumanization of Palestinians, the killing of more than 3,000 child, the scenes, the horror that we see, and the, and the, and the religious discourse that suddenly Netanyahu starts repeating and, and invoking Joshua bin Nun and his curse of Jericho, publicly, a prime minister of Israel is defending genocide and speaking about what the British did in the Second World War in Dresden, justifying all of that, plus planning to evacuate at least half of the population of Gaza and push them out of, 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 their, of their houses with very clear uh, cover and mandate of international powers, uh, of Biden, of, of, of uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Britain, the Germans, and the French. That's very interesting moment because, believe it or not, we have been talking about Western hypocrisy, all of us. But we have never seen this explicit hypocrisy shamelessly in front of our eyes ever. This is the moment where every kind of mask has dropped. And we see the faces of these leaders in front of us defending genocide, defending evacuation of people, defending destruction of, and denying even the right of Palestinian dead people to be acknowledged that they are dead. Biden is saying even the numbers are not accurate, you know? So, if you ask me, if you ask me as a Palestinian, what do I feel? Yes, I've been feeling a lot, you know? All of us have been feeling a lot, not only Palestinians. I think all over the world, the global south, you know, what we have seen is reminding every one of us Everywhere in Africa of the atrocities that I've spoke about, in Latin America, even in Asia, the humiliation that colonial powers have practiced, this is a moment which brings back to the world that memory when this white supremacy of the Western powers have imposed on the global south, and now in a tense moment is basically connecting with the roots of genocide and the roots of, of, of basically destroying indigenous people, not only in Palestine, but all over the world. In my opinion, we have a global struggle to make, not only Palestinian struggle. If we allow this to happen right now, it means we are going to sacrifice any future for something called justice 
And of course, international law, as you may have noticed, doesn't exist anymore. No one talks about it. I mean, the Israelis are the first people to attack it, and the Americans are giving them the cover. The international order, which has been built after 1945, the United Nations Security Council, of course, as you have noticed, does not exist anymore. But this is a moment where people, people, everywhere, including in the West, and countries everywhere, especially in the global south, should take things in hand and start looking forward to much more strategic option of moving away from this, you know, uh, this tragic uh, reality th that has been imposed on us. Thank you. Mean, uh... Thank you, Allah. Yasmin, in a statement uh, that was released by uh, Human Rights Watch, you uh, highlight the fact that, quote, there were warning signs, and those warning signs were already blinking red before October 7. What was happening on the ground in Gaza, what was happening in Israel and other Palestinian territories that should have told us that something was about to explode in the way that it did? having me on this panel and thank you to everyone that is here. I just want to first say that um, I want to hold everyone here in my heart and say that I know that for everybody this is an incredibly, incredibly difficult time. It's very heavy. It makes us for all feel incredibly hopeless. But I think coming together this evening and thanks to ICJP for bringing us together is so important to collectively show solidarity, to be one and to say every human life matters. So thank you for being with me here today to say that. So in relation to the context within which we see this happening. So Human Rights Watch came out with a report in 2021 and it was not by any means the first organization to say this, but we echoed what had been found by Jewish and Palestinian human rights organizations when we said that what Israel is doing is committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. They are systemically and violently discriminating against the Palestinian population. This is not just in their acts, but this is a policy of the state of Israel. One needs to no, look no further than the nation state law, which talks about Israel as a, sta a Jewish state and the right of self-determination for the Jewish Israeli people exclusively. We then only to need to look at the systemic discrimination that Palestinians suffer across the occupied Palestinian territories and across Israel. We see systemic discrimination in civil and political rights, those rights that are enjoyed by settlers and are denied to the Palestinian population. We have Palestinians now and hundreds that have been unlawfully detained in administrative detention without charge or trial. Children, women and many others. We have land rights in East Jerusalem that are held exclusively for the Israeli Jewish population and not for the Palestinian population. We have, as we know, had a 16-year blockade on Gaza. And we have had the continual expropriation of Palestinian land which supported violently by the state of Israel. So whilst everybody is correct, all of the international leaders are correct, and everybody is correct in saying that nothing justifies war crimes, whether committed by Hamas or whether committed by the state of Israel. What we're saying is that there is a context within which this happened, and I think very, very importantly, and I think a lot of people, and this is why the determination of crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution is important because for so many decades, 
and certainly this is what the State of Israel has sought to do, is see this as isolated incidents of violence, as you have noted, that come out of nowhere. And all of a sudden we are just talking about two parties to a conflict. And I am not saying in any way that parties to a conflict do not need to comply with international humanitarian law. They absolutely do. But the context within which this is happening is critically important because the siege, the absolute siege of the people on Gaza. No water, no food, no fuel, no electricity other than a little trickle is part of crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. that have been committed against Palestinians. My colleague and I, Emily MacDonald, who's sitting in the audience with me today, we were writing about the situation and we came across something so startling which speaks to the hypocrisy of the international community. That the 8,000 civilians, 8,000 civilians, Palestinian civilians that have been killed in two weeks, just over two weeks, is 88% of the civilian population killed in Ukraine in 19 months. And the world community quite rightly calls Russia to account, but has been silenced in relation to this onslaught against Palestinians, onslaught that we are seeing against children. Every 15 minutes a child is, die is being killed, every 15 minutes. That is how many children since we have already been sitting here. And yet the international community and particularly Western leaders have failed to call Israel to account. And not only have they done that, they have obstructed accountability at every step of the way. The ICC opened an investigation in 2021, and they are looking at crimes that have been committed on the occupied Palestinian territories, and they also have jurisdiction to look at crimes that are committed by Hamas and any other militant group. But they don't have jurisdiction to hear crimes, to, to, to look at, investigate crimes that happened in Israel, why? because Israel is not a signatory to the ICC, yet Palestine is. And what has the UK and the US done? Consistently try to obstruct the ICC and undermine the ICC's investigation in relation to Palestine. We've seen, as Taib noted earlier today, uh, earlier tonight, that the international community also has an obligation to exercise universal jurisdiction against war crimes and other crimes, including crimes against humanity. And Taib and his firm have been at the forefront of trying to ensure that that happens by issuing arrest warrants in 2014 and continuing. But what is the response of the UK government? The response of the UK government was to comply, to provide impunity by way of immunity to Israeli officials that come to the UK. Special missions immunity. We've seen again that the UK government has failed to halt arms to Israel, despite the fact that we know that pre in previous contexts, UK weapons have been used in Gaza to kill civil Palestinian civilians. And again, thanks to Taib's organisation and thanks to your work at Bidemans, they are holding the government to account and calling for them to immediately suspend all arms exports to Israel now. 
So I think where we're at now is a very, very sombering moment for international law, for international criminal accountability. We're at a moment in a precipice where, as has been noted, whether the world, when the world order that we established after the Second World War, will it hold or not? Or will the crushing hypocrisy of the Western world bring it down? And that is for them to answer now, because it's not just the safety and security of the Palestinians that are at risk, it's the safety and security of all of us. Because when they undermine the international rules-based order, they undermine it for everyone. So thank you for being here today. And as I said, I think very importantly, we need to think about the context within which this is operating. Thank you very much for that, Yasmin. Daniel Levy, if I could turn to you. That context uh, that Yasmin mentioned and that, men, and that all of our speakers mentioned so far is essential. It is crucial to understanding what is happening, why it is happening. At the same time, it is often difficult to make an argument, any argument, in the light of a tremendous loss of life that we have seen over the last three weeks. 1,400 Israelis have been killed. 8,000 Palestinians have been killed. There is so much grief and anger and calls for vengeance. We are seeing what we are seeing in Gaza today because of that call for vengeance, for that call of reciprocity. And the voices such as yourself and such as many of our guests today who have uh, attempted to draw uh, a, a wider lens uh, to what is happening have, have been met with um, that sense of anger. I want to ask you, when put in the context of the lives of people and the horrific events that we have seen, how do you begin a conversation that pierces through and opens up a space to something that can take us forward? I don't know if I have the answer to that question, to be frank. I don't know if I no. put it there, fantastic. I don't know anyone in Israel who has not attended a funeral in these last three weeks. I get daily reports from a colleague in Gaza running from one location to the other. One of his kids had a fractured skull the other day. I don't know a Palestinian who is not trembling at the reality they see. And, you know, at, at, at a certain level, I honestly don't understand how, and I'm not gonna tell you, that you're not gonna hear any special pleading from me, but I don't understand how there can be such a failure such an absence, I'm gonna go parochial here, of Jewish leadership. Such an abandonment of what I have understood to be the universal message of never again, the universalist takeaway of a Jewish ethic that I was at least brought up with. And that's not true across the board at a leadership level, it is so strikingly absent. And if you cannot acknowledge, if you're in denial even of the numbers, if you cannot acknowledge <clears throat> the pain and suffering of someone else, you're in a really dangerous place actually. Because you're beginning to cut yourself off from someone else acknowledging 
your trauma. Now, you know, there are brave people also, I consider them brave anyway, uh, levels of bravery at the moment anyway, but you know, you've had Na'amod, British Jews against the occupation, some of them are in this room, uh, out demonstrating. Now, you know, I get, and it was part of my upbringing, that I come from a traumatized people. Now, the instrumentalization of that and the wrapping of oneself in a unique cloak of victimhood, it's just not a place that you go to and it works out well for you. And I mean, I dip in and out of following the coverage in Israel, and it's, it's a very closed media environment there at the moment. So it's very hard to do the thing that you said. I think that something interesting has happened. Uh, you know, I mean, the status quo has been rent asunder. The status quo has just been smashed. By the way, things were shit on October 6th, okay? Things are inestimably shitter from October the 7th onwards, but no one should want to go back to October 6th, and we won't. Not in terms of the lives lost, but not in terms of the political reality of, so this is, my first answer to your question is, to quote succession, let's, let's start being sense of serious people. Because what we've had until now is not serious people. Do you know, <clears throat> most people would have no reason at all to be aware of this. But when the United Nations met in its General Assembly with all the world leaders just last month, do you know what the session that about 50 ministers, this was, it wasn't in, in the assembly itself, some people did reference, basically Global South leaders did make reference to Palestine, but the side meeting that took place during UNGA week at the UN was led by the European Union Special Envoy and by the European Union Vice President for Common Foreign and Security Policy, Joseph Burrell. You remember the, uh, the yeah, the, the, the jungle and the garden and, yeah, that guy. Um, <clears throat> Do you know the meeting they convened? They convened a meeting around the Peace Day effort. And what was the Peace Day effort, which had about 50 ministers in attendance, mostly European, many Arab states. It was about how do we show the parties how wonderful Peace Day could be? Not how do we impact the reality as it is today, but how do we avoid that reality altogether? And let's just think about what this US administration, let alone its predecessor, have brought to the table. And I hope all of you have a chance to read the print version of Jake Sullivan in Foreign Affairs rather than the online version, which he has had to correct, because in the print version, he said we've had the quietest Middle East in decades under the efforts of the, Bi uh, the Biden administration. And they created this alphabet soup of non-seriousness. The I2U2 was going to bring us peace. I2U2 is India, Israel, UAE, USA. So this is going to be peace. And the Negev Forum, fantastically named for anyone who knows anything about history, including the history of the people who live in Gaza. And the Negev Forum was the normalizing countries with Egypt and the United States and Israel. And this was going to somehow bring peace. And then the latest great addition is IMEC. No one has to know what IMEC is. The India-Middle East-Europe corridor, a transportational node that would run from India through the Gulf, Jordan, Israel, and into Europe. Economic peace, normalization, anything but addressing the actual bloody issue of Palestinian dispossession, denial of freedom and rights and statelessness, and you know, Right now, the military and, and everyone is in a, a horrific place. 
But in normal time, what any sensible military leader will tell you is, at best in a conflict, which has such deep root causes, we can buy you a pause. We can buy you a hiatus of time in which you can do politics. And Israel has categorically, unequivocally and consistently refused to address politics because it won't address the fact that there are Palestinians who need to have rights. But you know what's interesting for me at the moment is I quite often find that working on this issue, I almost feel like I'm working on this different planet. It doesn't link into everything else that's going on. And it feels to me like that has been shattered as well. We are now not only a part of what Adam Tooze calls the polycrisis, this is the epicenter of the failure of the structures of global governance as they exist, and as Yasmin just pointed out to us. This is a West retreating into a positioning that the rest of the world cannot take seriously because it's not serious. You stand there for 20 months and you self-righteously preach to us about the rules-based order in international law, and we know you're lying through your teeth because you only apply this selectively when it suits you. You have the audacity to respond in that situation in a way that caused massive food crises, supply chain crises, inflationary crises, debt crises to so much of the world without so much as asking us, and now here you are, transparent in your hypocrisy. And I think the West does Israel such a disservice, and I would think this. It's the emperor with no clothes, right? And the West is saying, no, 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 it's fabulous. You are trying to make peace. Oh, look, isn't that wonderful? And of course you have the right to kill three of the Holocaust. And, and, and I wonder whether it goes from trivialization into almost revisionism. But when an Israeli leader stands up and said, these are the new Nazis and this is worse than ISIS, and the Western leaders are standing there, intentionally or otherwise, and there's no reason at all I should cut them any slack, so I'll go with intentionally for now, you are putting yourself in a trap. Because how can you possibly turn round and say, oh, no, no, here's, you can't do that against the new Nazis. And we cannot hide behind this fallacy, this notion that Israel is absolved of all responsibility because Hamas exists in Gaza, and therefore everything is legitimate. And the numbers, by the way, just to talk about that, because Biden and Jake Sullivan have both given a, a tailwind to this Israeli claim that we can't trust the numbers. Well, the UN, these numbers are coming from the Gaza Ministry of Health. The UN has 13,000 personnel on the ground. And the UN has said, in the midst of a war, we cannot verify, but we have all those people on the ground and they are telling us these numbers seem correct. And by the way, tragically, we have experience to go by. There have been other rounds of escalation, and I can tell you the numbers that came from the Gaza Ministry of Health and the numbers that the Israelis ended up acknowledging and the UN differ by a margin of error of about 5%. Let me end by, despite everything I've said, trying to offer something positive in response to the challenge that you posed to me, Mohammed, and that I have... Um, really avoided uh, <laughs> thus far. Um, and it's to say this. I, I, you know, I wish things weren't as they were on October 6th, and I wish October 7th hasn't, hadn't happened in the subsequent three weeks, and what we've seen hadn't happened. But when something so disruptive happens, I think we need to be telling ourselves even if it's hard to push it to the forefront of our minds, that you can build something different. 
And this may sound um, Pollyannish in the extreme, but one of the things that I think October 7th showed is you can't build a wall high enough if there is such a level of dehumanization. And I actually think that maybe, maybe we should be questioning the partition paradigm because the partition paradigm has at its core we can't live together. And I think the building blocks going forward will so need to depend on rehumanizing that we should have the imagination to think beyond partition. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Professor Schleim, uh, I, I want to pick up on something that you said that was reiterated um, by Daniel Levy. And it is unfortunate and it's difficult to even frame a question like this because it is particularly sensitive. And this is about the issue of anti-Semitism and in particular the framing that we have seen with regards to the events of the last couple of weeks. We've seen this framing from the Israeli government and from Prime Minister Netanyahu in his language. And we have also seen this framing from members of the British government in their response to pro-Palestine activism, in response to marches through London, like the one that we saw on Saturday. It is difficult to have this conversation because anti-Semitism is, of course, real and because there are legitimate feelings of Jewish communities, both here and abroad. How do you respond to this framing? And what do you think is a constructive way to talk about what is happening while avoiding the pitfalls of getting into a conversation like this? <clears throat> I will begin by making a very clear distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. And an anti-Semitism is the hatred of Jews because they are Jews. Uh, Anti-Zionism is uh, opposition either to the Zionist ideology, the official ideology of the state of Israel, or more commonly, it's criticism of specific policies of the Israeli government, particularly policies towards the Palestinians, policies of the occupation. Um, Anti-Semitism is a very ugly thing and can never be justified. Anti-Zionism, most of the criticisms, most of the anti-Zionism, Zionist um, statements that I've come across are reasonable, evidence-based and legitimate. But is, the problem is that Israel and its friends and its very powerful friends around the world deliberately, deliberately conflate the two so as to uh, pretend to claim that any criticism of um, the state of Israel and its policies is anti-Semitic. And the last example of that I've already given at the beginning of my talk, which is the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, who made a very um, uh, humane statement about the need to cease fire and protect civilians. And the Israeli representative immediately accuses him of anti-Semitism and of blood libel. So th this is a very uh, clear illustration of the strategies of Israel and its friends around the world. Uh, Israel is very troubled by BDS. BDS is a global grassroots nonviolent movement. Nonviolent, nonviolent. And its main 
objectives are enshrined in international law. Um, the right of return of the 1948 refugees, an end of occupation, and equal rights to the Palestinian citizens of the State of Israel. And yet, the Israeli global campaign against BDS focuses or um, pivots on the claim that BDS is anti-Semitic. But it isn't. How could it be anti-Semitic? Um, and um, this campaign to demonize, uh, this campaign to um, silence critics of Israel has been very successful in Germany, where it's illegal, it's an offense to support BDS, and it's been extremely successful in this country, and the British government uh, has adopted the IHRA definition, which is a non-definition. It's completely vacuous. It says that anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, but it doesn't say what this perception is. Um, it's completely vacuous, it's a non-definition. But then there is a series of 11 examples of what may constitute anti-Semitism. And seven of these 11 examples relate to the state of Israel. Uh, and um, so it's uh, anti-Semitic under the IHRA definition to say that um, the state of Israel is a racist project. But as we all here agree, the state of Israel is a racist project, and hundreds of Israelis say that openly, and they don't encounter any opposition. But here, you are not allowed to say that. Um, and um, that other examples that relate, so the purpose of the IHRA definition that the British government has adopted fully and has tried aggressively to impose on all local authorities and all universities, the purpose of this definition is to silence free speech on Israel. Uh, its effect is not to protect Jews against anti-Zionism, but to denounce uh, and to silence uh, and to silence legitimate criticism of, of the state of Israel. And this is particularly unfortunate in the present context uh, in Britain, because we have a government that has failed on every front. It's a dismal government, uh, and yet uh, it is it's exploiting the current situation in Gaza in order to clamp down on pro-Palestinian protest, legitimate pro-Palestinian protest. So now the government, the Secretary of State for Education, right. uh, Suela um, Brotherman, the Home Secretary, are saying a Palestinian flag shouldn't be allowed because it means support for Hamas, and Hamas is a terrorist organization which is outlawed uh, in Britain. There is a Palestinian woman in Oxford who put up the Palestinian flag in her window. The police came and told her to take it down. She said, this is not a Hamas, or it's not a flag of a terrorist organization. Palestine is a country which is recognized by the UN, and the police told her, you have to take down the Palestinian flag. The uh, Suela Brotherman wrote a letter to the chief of the police telling he, ordering him to clamp down hard on pro-Palestinian protest. And she said to shout uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is anti-Semitic because it's a call for the destruction of the state of Israel. But it's nothing of the sort. It's uh, a call for freedom from the river to the sea for everybody. Um, And this, we've talked about Western hypocrisy. The British government 
is unbelievably hypocritical and its foreign policy doesn't make any sense. Its foreign policy says we support a two-state solution, but Israel has killed the two-state so solution. The two-state solution is as dead, is dead. It's as dead as a dodo. Is, it's as dead as the Oxford dodo, <laughs> whom I visit regularly in the Natural History Museum in Oxford. <laughs> Israel killed the two-state solution with settlements and with the wall. Everything that Israel does is illegal. All the settlements without exception are illegal. The annexation of Jerusalem is illegal. Um, um, th the wall, the security barrier is illegal. Everything Israel does and has done since 1967 is illegal. Everything, as we say in the south of the United States, everything from Izzard to Gizzard. Um, and, and this government is so extreme in its one-sided position uh, and its total indifference to Palestinian rights, its indifference to Islamophobia, and in exploiting the uh, conflict in Palestine uh, in order to make political capital, capital out of it um, uh, at, at home. And there is an official document, uh, Roadmap, um, I think it's called Roadmap. UK Israel Bilateral Relations 2030? 2030, UK Israel, Israel, Israel Relations. Yeah. And it's a trade agreement, and it's about security uh, cooperation in a large number of areas. But it has th three items which are extraordinary for a trade agreement. It says, the United Kingdom government w would oppose, opposes the referral of Palestine to the International Criminal Court. What business has Britain got to oppose the referral of this issue to the ICC? Secondly, the, the, the UK government uh, will continue to oppose BDS. Again, it has no business opposing a nonviolent um, civilian movement. And thirdly, it says the UK government um, will oppose a focus on Israel if the United Nations, but it, it's not the United Nations that chose, that picked on Israel and has a focus on Israel. It's Israel by its actions that is drawing um, uh, attention um, uh, to it. So the government, the foreign policy of this government doesn't make any sense because it supports a two-state solution that doesn't exist and is impossible. It's just a convenient phrase. And it says that the two parties should um, um, negotiate directly and sort out their own problems. This is absurd. Um, the asymmetry of power between Israel and the Palestinians is such that they could never willingly and as, as resolve their own problems. Mm. It's like putting a lion and a rabbit in a cage and sell, telling them, you sort out your problems. <laughs> On that note, actually, uh, we've spoken about the United States and, and its role and its fair share of criticism for its response. But one of its policies uh, that it has stated openly for its uh, view on the region and its, um, its objectives in the region is to maintain and protect Israel's security. Uh, if I can ask you, when it comes to the Palestinians, who, if anybody, is there to maintain the security of them? At this stage, basically no one, beside the Palestinians them, themselves. So the favorite statement that everyone is repeating now in the Western circles, centers of power, and even media, the right of Israel to defend itself. Look at that. This is very important. The right of Israel to defend itself. Against whom? Against the occupied people of Israel itself. 
against people who have been blockaded 16 years ago in a concentration camp, refugees under starvation uh, uh, siege, and then the right of Israel to defend itself. So when you, when you look at that, definitely you see that no one at this stage is uh, protecting the Palestinian people. Actually, not even protecting them, sending them water and sending them medical aid, try to give them food through the crossing of Rafah with Egypt is not allowed, but in, in a very tiny uh, way. So, of course, this is something that all of us are, are, are sadly witnessing. You know, I was reading in the Times in London the story, which I would love actually to give you the headline of it, which is very interesting. You know? The headline says, the story, meet the Britons defending the only place Jews feel safe. And it speaks about hundreds and thousands even of people leaving from Britain to fight against the Palestinians in Gaza. And the newspaper is proud to tell the, the heroic stories of these British people joining the fight in Palestine. You know? So we're not talking about defending the Palestinians. We're talking about this international you know, uh, uh, support uh, from the West in particular. And this is why I'm saying, you know, really, I'm, and I'm serious, I've been dealing with the Western media and Western politics and Western circles for decades now. I know exactly what I'm talking about. This is a moment where if the people in the West do not stand against their governments, they are sacrificing their future. This is a moment when if we do not tell truth to power, tomorrow we are going to suffer a lot of consequences of that. You know? So, the, I mean, when I look at even the national interest of these countries, look at the national interest of the United States of America that has declared that its main challenge is going to be China, you know? And now it finds itself protecting Netanyahu adventure in the region by sending its power and getting involved technically, not only by sending weapons, but also giving the political cover and even maybe engaged in, 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 in operations in, in a land. And what kind of strategic interest the United States of America is achieving by doing so? Why China and Russia are actually the countries that are building themselves? I remember in, 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 uh, when the war against Afghanistan and, and later on against uh, 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 Iraq happened, I covered both wars, by, by the way. I remember how much the Chinese and the Russians were happy about it. And I remember distinctly hearing in Beijing a statement, which I will never forget. In 2008, I heard from a very important official in the Chinese government that if the Arabs, at that time he said that word, if the Arabs did not engage with the Americans, the Americans would have been attacking us by now. So the priority was very clear. And the Americans are supposed to have learned from fighting with people in that region that there is nothing really to achieve because in both Iraq and Afghanistan, they haven't achieved much. They have actually drained their energy while everyone else is building his power. So imagine to what extent there is lack of focus, there is lack of, of statesmanship, lack of strategic uh, you know, uh, evaluation of the situation that Biden administration is dragging America back into the region and allowing everyone else to settle the account of America in our region. This is one. The second, which is extremely important, the world has changed. We are not in 2001. It is not the 11 September moment. The world since then has changed. We have moved beyond that. Now, the balance of power is shifting. And we have people challenging the 
American hegemony and the Western hegemony. And we have seen even in Ukraine how the global south did not respond the way that people responded on the 11th of September. So this issue has happened after the Ukraine. And of course, this is adding to the new challenge that the Western hegemony is having. So I see that there is lack of leadership, there is confusion, and there is even uh, some form of sacrificing national interest for the sake of something, in my opinion, is not going to give back, but more and more uh, loss of image, of a status, of, uh, uh, and rise, actually, of hatred. And unfortunately, this is, I have to say it. You know, when uh, some uh, stupidly naive person soon is going to ask why they hate us, I mean, really? You know? So the point is, I think history has not been uh, uh, looked at carefully, and people did not learn from it, and we are repeating, repeating the same mistakes, and then we have to move forward. I have another comment on, on what uh, Daniel has said about the partition and the land and the future. In moments like this, when everyone is going crazy, basically, especially you know the kind of media and genocidal language that we are hearing from from the from the uh, Israeli leaders uh, uh, and uh, from the Western uh, leaders in large and the call for religious wars and all this kind of, of statements, I love to go back to the foundations. The concept of antisemitism that I spoke about is very alien to our culture, by the way, in the Middle East. We did not have that concept of antisemitism. You know, this is not oriental issue. It has been an occidental issue. It is a Western issue. You know, so the Jews, when they historically, they had in the Islamic world, especially in the Middle East, the most welcoming environment. And they lived together with Muslims and the Christians because our land is a mosaic of culture for, for thousands of years. It has not been, you know, something like that. So what Daniel is speaking about, it might look now at this moment in time very you know, strange, but it, if, if we start thinking beyond, beyond Zionism and exceptionalism and all this kind of, 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 of things that have been developed for the last 78 years, we can easily start looking at the history of our region and naturally started developing indigenous approach to the reality far from the Western anti-Semitic legacy that led us to the current reality that we are in. So, you know, we need, I actually welcome his statement and I always say, we need a new, a new narrative because the old narrative has not only failed, I mean, it's beyond failed. It is dead, it is in the museum, but unfortunately they insist always on, on, on coming back to this kind of insulting, you know, uh, statement of peace process and so on and so forth. We need to go back to a new narrative. And this narrative, Daniel, might not be developed actually by the current politicians, mm -hmm. because the current politicians are investing heavily in that narrative, and they would love to sustain it and to maintain it, because they are very narrow-minded in their approach to politics. It's survival rather than a strategic national interest of any nation in this, at this moment in time. It is people, it is intelligentsia, it is the elite who, st who should start at this moment in time sitting together and developing alternative and putting it on the table. Otherwise, politics is very serious that we leave it to the current low profile politicians to handle it, believe me. So we need to be brave enough to sit and talk about the future and to go back to the foundations and in order to build a model which is part of the region. If we build a model that is part of the region, not a model that is imported from this rotten legacy of, of, of the genocidal Western uh, history, I think we can manage ourselves and find a solution and we could live in peace. Otherwise, if we still dedicating our time and energy to the peace process that has been, you know, 
uh, taking place for, for no reason, and for also the custodianship of the Western mind, I think we will continue to kill each other. So this is the choice. This is why, yes, I agree that we need a new narrative. We need the new imagination. We need to go outside the box and to think about this crisis. No one is happy to see the killing. Yes, I agree with you, Daniel. I mean, I am in my office. You know, a few days ago, I woke up and then the guy said, you remember this gentleman in my office working as an employee? Uh, he received a call from Gaza and 15 members of his family were killed overnight. Simply because, you know, in this case, they were evacuated to the south, south and they were killed in the south. So you go and sit with him and try to ease, you know, the pain by talking to him. And then, the day after, another person receives that call. Everyone who has a family in Gaza, he gets scared when his phone rings because he thinks at this moment and someone is going to tell me that someone from his, my family or the entire family has been, has been destroyed. In fact, another friend of ours received a call, 40 of his family, 40, 40. The grandmother, the three of, of, of the, of the, of the uh, uh, of three men, three of, of her, her sons and their sons and daughters and wives were killed overnight, 40, eradicated. We have tens of families who are totally annihilated. They have no offspring at all. And this is everyday kind of situation. Of course, I'm not saying this because we, we have been going through this for a long time. Me, myself, I haven't seen Palestine for the last 30 years. I was born in Jenin, but I couldn't go back to Palestine for more than 30 years now. You know, and millions of people across the world do not have that kind of a right. But with all that pain, I continue to say we need a new imagination where people could live in peace and where people could be equal and they have the right to dignity and to right, the right also to be respected as a humans in that land. And therefore, yes, I agree with you. And maybe it is the time, as you said, out of this hardship, out of this dead end, out of this, you know, black moment, that we could really start thinking about something new. Thank you very much. I, I can see you, uh, Daniel, nodding and, and writing vigorously. So, so I, I, I do want to give the floor open to you. But I, I'd I, love to riff on this. Yes, absolutely. Well, one of the things that I was going to ask you is that you know this event was initially supposed to be about the 30th anniversary of the Oslo Accords, and that Oslo Accords came out of off the back of the First Intifada, which was an uprising that was bloody and it was devastating and shook both Israeli and Palestinian societies to their core. But from it emerged this energy, this idea that from what has happened could spring about this sort of new thinking, this sort of imagination about how to resolve things and how to move forward. So how do you see the situation as it is now and what can spring from it? What kind of imaginative thinking can we think about? Can we open ourselves to? Yeah, and obviously there's a, one can draw that line from the conversation we would have been having to the conversation we are having because it's that failure to have delivered on Oslo which got us here. Now, you know, Oslo was going to be an imperfect peace. I don't know if there is such a thing as a perfect peace, but, you know, what I try and tell my Israeli, or what I used to try and tell my Israeli friends more, is you should have taken yes for an answer. You know, that was a Palestinian, when the PLO still was the PLO, not the Palestinian Authority, years of security collaboration, years of falling into disrepair. disrepair. That was the PLO saying yes to a mini state on 22% of historic Palestine, addressing the 67, not the 48 issues, in the face of significant opposition from the refugee community. I can't say whether it would have been sustainable. 
I can say it would have been unjust, but it may have taken us to, to, to a better place. Rather than grabbing that yes with both arms and then grabbing even more enthusiastically the yes it got from the entire Arab world with the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative, Israel nickled and dimed it to death. Well, no, not exactly sovereignty. No, not actually the 67 lines. Look, we can't move these settlements. No, we'll still maintain our army in your state. I mean, what, what, until Netanyahu actually gives a speech at, at Bar Ilan University in, you may or may not uh, help me out here, Avi. Um, when, thank you, I thought you would. Uh, <laughs> in 2009, where Bibi says yes to a Palestinian state, but what he's really saying is yes to all the things which empty the word state of its meaning, but if the West of the world wants me to say state, then who am I to say? Great, call it a state. In fact, others turn around in his government, call it a state, call it an empire, call it what you like. We all know what it really is. Um, now, for an awfully long time, this has been the proverbial dead parrot from the Monty Python sketch, the peace process. Now it's pining for the fjords. No, it's not. It's, it's been a dead peace process, and it's been a Potemkin peace process, and it, it has been artificially kept in order to fulfill really only one function at this stage, to maintain cover, to maintain a fig leaf for the deepening and entrenching of the permanent displacement of Palestinians. Now, where I want to go with this is to pick up on some of the things Wadah said, because, I mean, starting with that headline from the Times that you read out, because really confusion reigns at the moment. Um, so first of all, as a British Jew, if you publish that headline, what are you telling me? I'm not safe in this country, and that's okay? What craziness is this? Do you remember Netanyahu's response to the bombings in France and in Denmark of Jewish communal centers and, and the synagogue, a kosher supermarket? This shows that you all belong in Israel. Now, by the way, I actually get that for the, from the perspective of a state of Israel that is trying to... Um, ensure its impunity from its illegal actions, it makes sense in their toolbox of statecraft to deploy anti-Semitism in ways that are incredibly counterproductive for the well-being of actual Jews and actual Jewish communities. And I also get that as smaller Jewish communities, we have in, a, in an establishment institutional sense, almost put ourselves at the service of that state in allowing the state to embed itself in our security organizations, in, in every facet of our life. But it is hugely mistaken. I'm sorry, but the most dangerous place to be a Jew in the world today is Israel. So confusion reigns. Zionism is confused. If we are surrounded by Nazis, when we've got a nuclear armed state, what the hell is going on here? There is no logical thread in your argument. We will defend ourselves by ourselves. And by the way, America, when's the next plane landing with munitions? Because it ain't working out so well for us. If, if Israel, can only survive by the sword in that part of the world, then whatever people felt was necessary to pick up the pieces post-Holocaust, it is no longer an acceptable answer to the Jewish question, as it used to be called. But I'm not pessimistic because I just heard what Wadah said. And Wadah's not the only one speaking that language. And I think if we move, you see, I mean, there's been this whole, I'll come back to it if we move in a second, but there's been this whole uh, discourse that has, has accelerated post-October 7th uh, 
around the decolonization uh, framework and narrative, and uh, it, does that take you to a place where you glorify in what happened on October 7th? Because what did you think decolonization looked like? And no, you can believe in decolonization and still call the actions of October 7th by the correct term and deplore the killing of civilians. I don't think you can go to that if you understand that there are different versions of colonialism and settler colonialism, and that this is a version where the Israeli Jews are not going anywhere, then you have to start thinking, what does that mean? And I think what, what, what we're opening a door here to is by saying that if this is not a regime of domination, of supremacy, of the structural violence of apartheid, then we can build a basis for equality here. And actually, we can acknowledge your indigeneity as Jews in this part of the world. That's the place where we can meet. But we have to do it from a basis of equality, from the breaking down of the structures that prevent that from happening. And that's why I'm saying, and it's, I, I get it, we're, sitting, we're both sitting here in London. Me, because it wouldn't be a good idea for me to return right now. You, because uh, you, can't, you haven't been able to go there for 30 years. Um, but I think if we can have that conversation here, we can have that conversation in other places, and we can take that conversation where it needs to be taken. Because right now, it's an us or them. And that's the path to hell. That's the hellscape we are in. And one other brief comment, because we've talked about the UK... Um, I think this is a horrendous moment for Western democratic politics because it shows how singularly incapable the way we now manage our political structures with social media and the relentlessness of the news cycle, how singularly incapable we are of doing grown-up national security, foreign policy thinking. Um, and in this country, it's also fed into an extremely pernicious cultural war that this government uh, has been waging. And I will say it here, and I've said it before, I think my community are incredibly short-sighted in, in offering ourselves up to be deployed in that cultural war. A, such a dangerous path and this could look what happens in Gaza if it keeps going on we've already had more than 120 Palestinians killed in the West Bank we've had 1500 arrested East Jerusalem hasn't popped yet there's a, a climate of fear and terror inside 48 Israel my Palestinian Israeli friends fear stepping outside Itamar ben Gavir, the national security minister, is handing out weapons. I believe he is only in power because of the indulgence of Israel's international backers in allowing extremism to run wild. So this could spread, and of course it could spread regionally. We, we haven't spoken about the northern border, etc., so what, what, what I'm saying in that is that this failure of Western politics needs to be challenged. But I also think we, <clears throat> we, we shouldn't be so surprised. I mean, wow, former colonial power that, you know, that built its wealth on, its, on how it treated the other. America, you know, built on the elimination of the indigenous population, its wealth built on, you know, kind of, yes, 
please do better. But there's also an element of what, what, what would we expect here. And what I would say, amongst other things that have been shattered, is the notion that we can go to an American monopolized process for bringing peace to Israelis and Palestinians. And we live in an era of geopolitical fluidity and bring it on. I don't want, we had this thing called the quartet, it was a joke. It was when America wanted some cover, it brought the quartet people along. We must not return to that, and, and I, Palestinians must not return to that. If America says, let's come to an American-sponsored thing, we need a Palestinian leadership that is capable of saying, no, no thanks. We want these people in the room, if you want us in the room. Thank you for that, Daniel. Um, we are going to open up the, to questions um, in a moment, but I just wanted to ask you, Yasmin, uh, quickly, a question about the rule of law and international law and the danger we could be in where any kind of hope placed on an institution of international law can be undermined when people feel like that is not being upheld by certain actors, and, or certainly there is no standard internationally. And I want to refer, reference your, the work that you did uh, on Yugoslavia, and, and uh, where you know, there was a genocide that took decades to prosecute, but eventually it was. What do we need to do to ensure the status of international law remains in place, or is restored to the place that it needs to be? I'll try and be quick because I also know that there's probably a lot of questions that people want to ask. Um, look, I think essentially international law is made by states and has to be adhered to by states. And as has been said um, on multiple occasions by this panel, um, the, the international rules-based order that we know now was actually born out of the ashes of the Holocaust. It was saying, no, this will never happen again. And I think that we are, that it's also been reflected on, which is right, that it's these moments now that put the greatest strain and question the integrity of the order. <laughs> and the integrity of the order lies in the equal application of that law, no matter who it is. And what we've already seen in these circumstances is that you will have states like China and Russia who are gonna utilize these moments of hypocrisy for their own purposes. And obviously it undermines the integrity of any state when they say in one breath, I mean in one breath like in the context of Ukraine, they are pouring money into the International Criminal Court. They are hosting events for the ICC prosecutor. And literally in the next breath, they are trying to undermine the investigations. So I think, I mean, what is really important though, is, and I think sort of building on what we've heard in the panel, is that we are in though a new age. We are not in an age of Western hegemony. And that does provide hope, because what we are seeing is a rise of the global majority saying no more, challenging the former hegemony of the West, challenging the impact and the ongoing effect of colonialism across the world, and saying this is not just an international world order that's built for you, by you. This is an international world order that we hold. And we saw that just in the last few days. The Security Council was deadlocked because of, surprise, surprise, America would not pass a resolution that merely provided for humanitarian access, a pause in the conflict prov to provide Palestinian people with water and food and medical supplies. They wouldn't support that. And yet it was the UN General Assembly, the place where every state in the world comes together that was resoundingly clear in their support for the Palestinian people and rejecting the crimes committed by Hamas and saying no more and never again. So I do think that while there is um, a real question of the integrity of the international world order. I think, thankfully, we're in a moment of shift, of power shifting, shifting between governments, away from governments to movements. I think we've seen 
the fact that the Abraham Accords have been fundamentally challenged by this is also because the people of those states, the people of Egypt, of Saudi Arabia, of countries across the world are saying no, not in our name, to their despotic leaders. And their despotic re leaders realise that they can no longer support what, they, what was a normalisation with Israel anymore. So this shift in power is actually, I think, the light for all of us. And it is the light, hopefully, for the Palestinians. Um, so I'm not completely um, pessimistic, but I would say that these are the moments where the international world order is on the precipice of whether it's going to succeed or not. So we will take a couple of uh, brief questions, and, and I do implore you, please keep your questions brief, and out of respect for our guests, please keep them as questions. Um, we are going to try and get through as many as possible, and also, when you do say your question, please uh, let us know who you'd like it to be directed at. We have a microphone roaming. Um, let's start in the front here for this uh, gentleman, please. Uh, okay. Uh, hi guys, uh, Yaman Mohammed here from LBC Radio in London. Uh, I've got two very quick questions for Daniel and Waddah. The first one for Daniel, um, today we were actually discussing the idea if, you know, Israel are bombing Gaza with the idea that Hamas is hiding underneath potentially hospitals, etc. So they're going to keep bombing it until they can quote unquote eliminate Hamas. My question to you is, would Netanyahu's government strategy be different had Hamas been hiding in Israel? So what if Hamas were hiding in Israel? What if they were hiding underneath Ben-Gurion airport? Would they be bombing the airport in the same way that they are bombing Gaza? Or do you think they would be approaching with a different strategy? And for Waddah, my question to you is, uh, Hamas is whatever you want to describe it as, what they did on October the 7th, changed the course of history as we know it. And to a huge portion of the world, it's seen as barbaric. Um, so I highly doubt that they will be the voice that will move forward this conversation that you and Daniel are hoping to take forward in terms of the Palestinians. So with your knowledge in that field, there's no hope in the PA. Hamas seems to be leaving the conversation after this is over. Who do you think will be leading the Palestinians' voice in that conversation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daniel? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, I think the thing is here that Israel actually made its, what it was going to do clear. It has something that it implemented in 2006 in Lebanon called the Dahya Doctrine, which is a neighborhood in Beirut uh, where uh, Hezbollah uh, is, has some of its leadership based. It's a Hezbollah stronghold. And one of the current war cabinet ministers was the chief of staff at the time, or maybe he was head of the Northern Command. Um, Eisenkot, and he said that we will destroy this neighborhood. And the Israelis have said, some of the Israeli leaders have said, no, we don't distinguish between combatants and civilians. So they're kind of, they're not hiding this, that that's, that that's what they're doing. Um, I mean, look, I used to be based in, in the Kiria, which is the Defense Ministry and IDF headquarters in Tel Aviv, which is kind of next to um, the, the plush, expensive towers of, of, of central Tel Aviv. Um, <clears throat> the thing is, <coughs> excuse me, this is what asymmetric warfare looks like. Now, if you actually want to isolate a militant insurgency, there are many ways of going about it. Keeping the entirety of the people 
in whom the militant insurgents are embedded against you is not one that has ever thought will work well. It's kind of counterinsurgency 101. You try and peel off as much of the population from the armed insurgency as possible. Israeli behavior towards the Palestinians 101 is make everyone hate you. If you're the PA and you've agreed to diplomatic negotiations and you've desisted from armed struggle, then embarrass the hell out of them. Make them your subcontractors. Make sure that they are vilified and hated and discredited amongst their public because they went into a process and they had the stupidity of believing you. If you're the rest of the civilian population in Gaza, keep them besieged, blockaded, Collectively punish. If you're a kid that was born when the Israeli blockade in Gaza started, you're pretty close to finishing high school. You're somewhere in sixth form in our equivalents now. You know, there's an Israeli organization, a human rights organization, which deals extensively with Gaza, called Gisha. And many years ago already, three years into the beginning of the blockade, through a freedom of information request, they actually got the Israeli government to publish its, its policy of what it lets in. And, and it controls every kind of food type. And it said that they, they, they judged that to just keep people above the starvation line, it took 106 trucks a day of supplies. Today, we celebrated 45 trucks getting in because of the great efforts of the American administration. So yeah, if you... If, if you want to offer an alternative, you, offer, you, you, you give people belief in an alternative. But as, 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 as I think Avi said, you know, if Palestinians pursue nonviolent sanctioning, then that's BDS, that's anti-Semitism and economic terrorism. If you go to the ICC, that's diplomatic terrorism and lawfare. I mean, yeah. Uh, over yeah. to you. So this is a question about Palestinian leadership. So when it was left for the Palestinians, actually we didn't have a problem of representation because Palestinians did elect democratically a government uh, of national unity where Fatah and Hamas were part of it and that government was uh, not accepted by international community and the Israelis rejected it and eventually it led to what we are at, at this moment in time, the total delegitimization of the Palestinian National Authority in West Bank and the blockade of Hamas in Gaza. The, that was the result of rejecting the democratic choice of the Palestinians. Uh, I don't have a problem of, because the issue is the Palestinians are a very educated nation. And regardless of all the pain that they have gone through, but also they are very pragmatic in a way. They understand uh, uh, you know, necessities and how to handle issues. And I remember when the national unity government was formed and Hamas did actually one majority in the, in, the, in, the, in the legislature at that time, they delegated to the government, which was led by Mahmoud Abbas, the task of negotiating with the Israelis based on international uh, resolutions. So we did not have an issue when it was left for the Palestinians. The problem emerged when that project was assassinated, basically, and destroyed and replaced by, uh, by, by the current reality that we are suffering from. Uh, so in the future, whoever going to represent the Palestinians in forming their future, it will be the Palestinians themselves by choosing and electing their leaders in order to move forward. This is if the international community and the Israelis accept that really we need to resolve this conflict. So I don't see an issue uh, actually in that particular uh, field. Now, there are many scenarios to the current reality. You know, I wish if we could reach that moment, which, which you are asking me about, but looking at the current reality and the scenarios, uh, yes, it is very, very, very dangerous one because uh, this region could explode. Uh, technically speaking, there is a real possibility of a regional war. And this regional war automatically is going to become a global proxy war. 
you know, because I think the Chinese and the Russians and the Americans, of course, they are there. So basically, it's going to be a global proxy war in, the, in, in our region. And if that happens, imagine the kind of complications that could emerge. Not only it, it has started because of Gaza on 7th of October, but we may forget how did it start if this become regional, you know? And always I remind people, the First World War started by assassination of one individual, or one, one individual and his wife, in, in Sarajevo. And then later on, people forgot about it, why it started, because the issue did not become the issue of the assassination. Even Serbia was not mentioned in that context. Later on, people went beyond it into much more grand scale confrontation. The world is going through a very dangerous moment. There is deep imbalance in the world order, and there is great anger in the region, and there is also loss of hope. After the Arab Spring, you should remember that the counter-revolutions did not provide our young people with hope. They did promise them hardship, poverty, uh, lack of jobs, and also lack of political venue to change their reality. This is very dangerous situation. So if you trigger that kind of confrontation, given this fanatic religious discourse coming from Washington and from Tel Aviv, yes, we are in a very dangerous moment. So I hope that a moment will come when the Palestinians really will be asked to come and represent themselves. That will be the easiest thing to, to, to do, given the complication of the reality. OK. Great. Um, let's take another question. Uh, I think you're. OK, thank you so much. Just before I start my question, I just want to say, uh, as a half Syrian, half Palestinian, I really admire you, Danian and Levy, and every Jewish in this room and every Jewish in this world who are uh, standing by our side. I know this takes strength and courage and comes at a cost on all levels, so I really, really admire this. Thank you. Um, so uh, just 20 seconds introduction to my question. The conflict between Palestinian and, and Israel, has mul it's multi-level. There is the economic, the political, uh, the military, and there's also what I'm interested in is the narrative war, the consciousness war, and the discourse war. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I just want to understand from Wadah uh, first, how do you think we can shift the perception of people here in the West to, uh, especially when the whole media channels are imposing the Zionist um, consciousness and the Zionist agenda and narrative on the West. So how we can break through this and make a change in the West, in the Western perception? And if we manage to do this, my question to either uh, Yasmin or to Avi is, if this happened, we changed the perception of the West. Today, imaginary situation, the West became understanding of the Palestinian cause. Does that change? And how does this change the political uh, infrastructure in the West in a way to support Palestinians? Especially, especially that in the Vietnamese war, we know that the majority maybe of Americans were against the war. Nevertheless, the power holders continued the war. So if we change the narrative here and the perception, will that lead to change and how? Thank you very much. Um, and I do apologize, we are about to run out of time. So I will ask you guys to wrap up uh, your thoughts as quickly as possible, uh, beginning with you, Wada. So this dangerous moment uh, normally emerges when a superpower or superpowers or geopolitical centers are in decline. They lose rationality and balance. And I think the Western, uh, the Western uh, powers are losing balance at this moment in time. This is where they are irrational in the way that they are behaving. This is why the responsibility on the people to be very vigilant, monitoring what their leaders are doing and acting to uh, to, to stop the, the, the decline uh, towards, in my opinion, uh, chaos and anarchy in the future, because this will affect the whole world. Uh, and the issue of Palestine, as I said, is one issue, but I can name many, which really lately the Western judgment, the official Western judgment on matters 
is actually imbalanced and at the same time is actually anti-Western interest. So I think now is the moment where people start working and being very much vigilant and aware to the messages, messages coming from mainstream media. You remember always that mainstream media, when it comes to foreign policy in the West, is a reflection of the interest of centers of power, centers of power, wealth and, 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 and governments. We need to be aware of that. And we need to look at facts as they are from independent sources and act upon it, not be aware only. Because our voices could be heard. Here is a great example of what we have done in London. The first few days, if you remember, the kind of propaganda, you know, and also the governmental uh, declarations against, you know, protests and, and symbols of Palestine were huge, immense. But what did the people do? They challenged that. They challenged that and they went down to the streets and we should continue doing this everywhere. And this will start changing because the elite eventually will listen when they feel that their interest is threatened in the next elections or when their interest is threatened when it comes to economic boycott or any kind of action that the world is going to do. I am the last one who would like to see the West decline into a state of lack of total morality and ethics. Because I was brought up as a journalist to follow the principles of journalism as we have learned it from the Western School of Thought. You know, but I am very sad to report to you that at this moment in time, I cannot see you know, these values uh, uphold by media. And, you know, and therefore, yes, do it. Do it yourselves. Don't delegate the situation to governments or to media, mainstream media. I think we have now much better ways of doing things than looking at the screen of the BBC and many other channels, CNN and others. Thank you very much. Professor Schleim. The world is now at a very, very d dangerous moment. Uh, and there is a view, and Netanyahu is the main proponent of this view, that the Palestinian issue has become irrelevant. Uh, what is happening in Gaza now shows this is still, has always been the central issue in the Middle East. And it's the one issue that could blow up the whole region. Some people are saying this is Israel's 9-11. No, it isn't. It isn't. And the Israelis, Netanyahu, led by Netanyahu, and now more and more ministers are saying um, Hamas is ISIS. And you may have noticed that a lot of Israeli spokesmen say Hamas, ISIS, as if they are interchangeable. They are not. ISIS is a jihadist movement, it's a globalist movement, it's a, it's a nihilist ideology, whereas Hamas is a regional um, uh, movement with a regional agenda, and its objective is not destruction of the West or of Israel, its objective is to obtain freedom and independence for the Palestinians on their own uh, homeland. So you must not confuse um, uh, Hamas wi with ISIS. And this is not a 9-11 moment for Israel. It's dangerous to think that because look what happened after 9-11. America embarked on a global war against terrorism. The real purpose of that war, the original name was the war against radical Islam. Mm -hmm. But then they changed it to uh, the global war on terror. But terror is a form of warfare. Um, uh, and uh, the result of that simplistic view, um, simplistic view popularized by the Harvard professor Samuel Handington, that this is a clash of civilization. There is 
um, Judeo-Christian civilization against Islam. This is what it is about. No, it isn't. That's a really silly and superficial notion, but it, it uh, informed American foreign policy, and the result was the disastrous occupation war in Afghanistan and then Iraq, and the destruction of these two societies for no good reason. Uh, and if Israel now interprets this in terms of terrorism, of having to fight Palestinian terrorism, the result would be just more and more bloodshed. That's mm -hmm. not a, a solution. Thank you. Uh, and I would... <laughs> Yasmin Ahmed, uh, for a final brief word, please. Um, I would just say, just speaking to the question of narrative, I think it's a, a really, really important question. And, and one thing I think we should not lose hope in is the fact that the narrative has significantly changed. And part of that, the reason it's changed is because it's long term. We can't only expect that we will change the narrative in moments of hostility because we won't. But the work that I must say human, uh, the Israeli and Palestinian human rights organizations have been doing for decades to make clear that what is happening are systemic human rights abuses and crimes that means now, in this current context, that I think for the first time I have seen, certainly for the first time for the UN, to start talking about the context within which this is happening. We are no longer just hearing about Israel's right to self-defense. We are talking about the context of the subjugation and the expulsion of the Palestinians since the Nakba. And that is the context, and I think we should we should find hope in the fact that that has changed. It might be small, but it is very, very important. And the second thing I would say from work that I've been doing in the United Kingdom is saying I think that politically the Jewish community in Western countries, the diaspora community and the broader Jewish community have a very critical role to play because they help to insulate political parties that want to speak up from claims of anti-Semitism. They are very critical for the narrative change and for the political change. And I must say, they have been, as Human Rights Watch working in the UK, our most critical allies in this. And so, for me, coming back to what you have both been saying, it is actually all of us working together as a united front to, to challenging this. And if we do that, and we know that all of our interests are in doing that, then I think that we can eventually get to the place that we want to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to close us off, I would like to invite uh, Tayyip Ali back on stage, and as he uh, joins us, please join me in uh, thanking this fantastic panel for a fantastic night. Very short, actually. Um, you know, this event nearly didn't happen. The original event was 30 years um, after Oslo, and then... Um, 7th of October happened, and we wondered whether we should hold an event like this. And then we lost some guests who couldn't come out of Palestine, Israel, and we wondered whether we should hold an event like this. And then people said to us it was insensitive to hold an event like this at this time. But I think for me, this has been a better education than I had at university. Um, it's so important. <clears throat> it's been so important to hear that there are answers actually. We're told by the mainstream media, by Israeli commentators, that there are no answers, that it has to be military death and destruction. And we've heard, heard today for two hours answers to all these questions. We have a roadmap in front of us, a real one. And ICGP will be committed to working with our guests and others and the legal process to ensure we have accountability for Palestinians. Final words, please. Can we just say thank you to our guests, Daniel, Gaston, Abby, 
I'm not having a thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.